Oh, sorry. There we go. It's E, yeah. And then Chen will contribute to the development of space flight. No, nothing in there about making it special. So apparently that's not important to the government, space flight, right? These other things are. Okay, true or false? They all turn out to be true. Okay, how many got the true and false right? That's pretty good because there's four opportunities to get it wrong. Yes? So that's pretty good. All right. Okay. Good, bad, ugly quiz. This is much better than some. Oh, this is a better one? Okay. All right, maybe you got there. It's getting better. <laughs> I totally did not see the, which one was not. So I oh, so you circled all the other ones? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, well, I'll, I can understand that. All right. Well, today, um, let's see what we're going to do. We're going to talk about 102. 102 is the big, big banana here. Yes? Mm hmm. Now, 102 is a little bit confusing because it has all these exceptions in it, right? So again, I think it's helpful to look at the tables of contents for the USCs and see how this stuff is kind of organized, right? So you got chapter one, which is sort of the uh, establishment of the office of the USPTO, that kind of stuff in there. Basic stuff. Um, chapter two, as they call it. Note all these sections that are in chapter two start with a what? A two, okay? So you're in the 20s. Chapter three starts in the what? The 30s, okay? And it's about practice before the Patent and Trademark Office, right? So what do you need to get in there? Or suspension of you, right? Okay, chapter four is about fees, yes? And how to fund the office. So the USPTO is paid out of the fees that are paid by um, people when they apply for patents. So your tax money is not going to support the USPTO. Okay? The fees for the patent applications. Not the fees for the attorneys. Those go to support the attorneys. Yes, but the fees that the attorneys pay to file the applications and all that kind of stuff. That goes to support the USPTO. All right. So it's kind of like uh, its own little business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's got its own budget, and if it brings in more money, they can keep that for next year, right? And you do stuff with it, things like that. Yeah. And if it doesn't bring in enough, it can raise the fees independently. The director can. So yeah, it's separated from all that other stuff. You don't so have to worry about Congress appropriating money for the USPTO. If it's separate, then why was it like you were saying? They were going to shut down after a certain amount. I don't know. I don't get that. Yeah, I don't understand that at all. Okay. Unless that's just, um, maybe they just outsource that call center. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, under law, right? It is kind of the Department of Commerce, right? It is located uh, in the Department of Commerce, but its budget is its own budget, yes? Oh, uh, okay. You know, it, it manages its own budget. Now, um, <clears throat> now, so I, that, that's confusing now to say that. That's a good question. I remember hearing something about how um, some of the inventions at the Consumer Electronics Show weren't going to be there because they couldn't get filed with the Trade Commission. It's like everything has to be, it goes through like a certain regulation. Mm -hmm. So I don't think new inventions could have been patented because they couldn't have gone through that regulation. Well, this has been the way since it's established way back when. A long time ago, so yeah, they got their own budget. I don't know, but we'll check the rest of it. Yeah, I'm interested in how that works. So anyway, let's go on to chapter 100. And if you look at the tens, chapter 10 is all about patentability of the invention. Okay, so that's what we're in here, from 100 to 105. Okay, all the way to inventions in outer space. Yes. Okay. So this is what we're zooming in on now, right? Okay. We'll talk more about AIA versus pre-AIA later. Yes? We're going to just go AIA for now. So when you learn to drive a car, it's usually easier to start with the automatic, right? And once you get good at that, we'll go to the manual, and you can learn how to use the clutch. Yes? So same sort of thing going on here. We'll start with the AIA, because it's a little bit simpler in some ways than um, the pre-AIA. All right. 
And we're going to focus on 102 here, conditions for patentability, or novelty, or sometimes they call it um, anticipation. So here it is. Okay, you can see USC 102. Okay, right there. You got the A, which you guys have been memorizing, right? Novelty, USC 102A, part one and part two. And that's what we've been focusing on, right? Yes? Talked a little bit about USC 102, paragraph B, the exceptions. Right? We talked a little bit about that with respect to your grace period. We're going to focus in more on this paragraph today. And then on Monday when we come back, we'll talk about C, common ownership through joint inventions, joint research groups, and we'll talk about part D as well there. Yes? So we're going to talk a lot about D today, <coughs> about exceptions, because it's all in the nitty-gritty here. Yes? So we're going to get into the nitty-gritty. All right. So this is some material that the USPTO puts out to teach you about this stuff. Okay? So we'll see how well it flies with you guys. If you think it's good, bad, or ugly. Yes? It's not too bad looking. It's not pretty. Right? So, get your USC 102 out, right? You've got it out in front of you. Follow along. You have that little chart and that one piece of paper, right? That I gave you. This one. I don't know where you go. There it is. Got this one. Yeah, so I have this one and that flow chart. These two. Have those in front of you as we go through these things, right? And kind of watch this, okay? Because, you know, the code itself is wordy. We've got to make sense of the wordiness here, right? And sometimes it's good to kind of visually make this thing, right? You know, all this patent stuff is word related. It'd be a lot easier to just draw it out in a diagram, right? So that's kind of what they're trying to do here, draw a diagram. So USC 102A1, what does USC 102A1 say? It says, the claims invention was patented, described, Described in a printed publication or in public use, on sale, or otherwise available to the public before the effective filing date of the claim invention. And if that's true, then you can't get the patent. Right? So here you go. There's your effective filing date. Okay, that's when you filed it with the office. And 102A1 says that any of this stuff that happened before that date can knock you out. Right? It could be patented. It could be described in a printed publication. Could be in public use, okay? And the public doesn't even know it has to be in public use. That's what's kind of screwy here, right? I mean, you could be using it in public without people knowing that you're using it, but that still counts as public use. So how do they verify that one? I just, I don't know. You know, there's a, a famous lipstick question. You want to get a famous lipstick question? It's a lipstick question. Okay, so Rebecca, we can pick on Rebecca because she's not here today, right? <laughs> so Rebecca, you know, invents this lipstick, right? That um, tingles when you kiss somebody, right? Yes, the tingle lips, lipstick, yes? And, you know, she works diligently on this, you know, experimenting, getting the tingling just right, yes, right? Mm -hmm. And then finally she gets it right and she thinks she's got it. Right? And then she goes around to parties and stuff, kissing people on the cheeks and stuff, right? And they get tingled and things like this. She gets tingled. They don't know what's going on, right? Yes. And then, you know, more than a year later, she files for the, the patent. She's knocked out because it was in what? Public use. Even though people don't know what she was doing, what it was that tingled their cheek, yes? Right? Yeah, public use. There's a, a question on um, floor wax, right? So the grocery guy gets tired of cleaning up the floors and people knock stuff down off the aisles, right? And he invents this super cool floor covering that um, doesn't let stuff stick to it, right? So you can just, you know, suck it all up afterwards. No more sticky soda pop stuck to the floor, right? Yep. And uh, so he starts using it in his um, grocery store, right? He uses it for a year and stuff. Never tells anybody about it, but he's been using it. And he's been using it where? In public, 
even though the public doesn't know about it. But if he waits for more than a year after he starts using it in public, after he established the formula, right, then he's out of luck. Now, if he was experimenting in public, right, up to like, you know, a few months before he filed the patent application, that's okay. Right? But if he established the formula, or Rebecca established the lipstick, right, and no more experimentation was being done, and you were using it in public, even if the public doesn't know about it, you're out. Okay? That's so kind of a funny one, I think. Does the yeah. patent office verify this? I don't know how they verify stuff like that, yeah? I mean, that's a good question. You know, so that's an assu it just assumes that... Do they know, ask you, or...? Maybe. You Maybe that's under that? CFR 1.105, right? Yes, they could ask you, and you'd have to, you know, provide, you know, your little journals and stuff. Say, oh, yeah, established formula in May, right? Kiss a whole bunch of people through, you know, July of next year, yeah, yes? Right. You know, I mean, if it's in your journals, then you're kind of stuck, right? Yes? So, um, yeah, so they might ask you to provide them information from which they could figure out that kind of stuff. Or they could just, you know, ask you in words, right? And if you admitted it, then they can use that against you, too. Yes? There's no Fifth Amendment with the Patent Office, right? What you say can be used to incriminate you. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, we're spending too much time on that, right? This is supposed to be the easy one. Okay, so there we go, right? How come we're not moving forward here? Let's try it this way. There we go. All right, so here's USC 102A2, right? Okay, and if we go look at our thing here, what does USC 102A2 say? It's the second thing that will knock you out, right? The claimed invention was described in a patent issued, right? Or in an application for patent published or deemed published in which the patent or application, as the case may be, names someone else. So this is if somebody else does the work, right? Okay? And was effectively filed before the effective filing date of the claimed invention. So if somebody else did it before you did it, then you're out as well. Okay? So again, anything before the effective filing date, 102A2 says, hey, that knocks you out. Right? That's pretty straightforward. Right? I think. Isn't it? Okay. All right. So let's um, look here now. Here's this little table that we have. We have 102A. Yes? Right? And it's 102A1 and it's 102A2. It's 102A1. Yes, disclosures with prior public availability date. So this is you disclosing stuff. Here's 102A2. This is other people disclosing stuff. Yes? And then over here are the what? The exceptions to these guys. So 102B1 lists the exceptions to 102A1. 102B2 lists the exceptions to what? 102 a2. Right? So it's the exceptions that um, always mess you up. Okay? Some of the exceptions are simple, some of them are, are less simple. So keep this little chart in front of you. I know it's a little bit hard to read. Don't blame me, blame the USPTO. Right? I try to grayscale it to get it to be more clear. Right? You might have to write over top of it to clarify it. Okay? But this is how it works. Alright. So let's do some scenarios here. So, exceptions to prior art under 102A1. So, 102A1 is about your stuff, right? Yes? This is your stuff in 102A1, okay? And the one of the exceptions that we have is this grace period, right? So, if you file in May 1, right, you've got a grace period for one year, yes? So, anything you release in that time is okay under the exception and what's that exception? Under 102B1. Yes? Okay. If it's before the grace period, what? No exceptions. And again, I think that's pretty clear. Isn't it, Garland? Yeah? So, so far, I think we're, we're all good here. Okay? All right. All right, so let's see if you guys are tracking here. Okay? Let's ask you these questions. Which one of the following statements is true? 
The best prior art date is any date more than one year before. I mean, you're thinking now as the examiner. If you're the examiner, this is for you, okay? If you're the examiner, which of the following statements is true? The best prior art date is any date more than one year before the actual filing date of the application, regardless of any claim for priority. Or the prior art having a date between an application's actual filing date and a claim priority date is never useful. Okay. Right? So remember what the priority date is. The priority date is what you may be claiming. Yes, maybe not be your actual filing date because you may have filed a provisional first. Yes? Okay. C, an application's grace period is always measured from the application's actual filing date. Is that true? No, not true because it could be measured from what? Yeah, somebody I heard somebody say it, right? So let's say, here's your filing date. <coughs> yes? But this filing date may claim priority to what? This previous provisional's filing date. Yes? Right? Well, I thought when you filed a provisional that that filing okay. date counted, I mean, Usually, what the filing date? The non-provisional can claim the benefit of the provisional filing date. Yes. So this okay. one is saying, letter C, an application grace period is always measured from the application's actual filing date. Oh. So they're saying, oh yeah, the, the grace period goes from here for a year, but no, it goes from where? Here for the year. Yes. Okay. I thought mm -hmm. that most of the time when you mention the filing date, it usually means Filing date, the earliest possible filing date. Yeah, your earliest filing filing date is what you claim priority to, and that's this. But unless it says that, this is the actual filing date. It's talking about the filing date of the patent application that you're talking about here. Okay. Yes, not what you claim benefit to, right? So C is, you know, obviously out of there, right? The best prior art date is any date more than a year before the earliest possible effective filing date. So that's what Garland's thinking about there. Yes. So which one thinks, if you're the examiner, where are you going to look for the prior art? A, B, C, or D? Which would be the best one to knock this guy out? A? Any date more than one year before the actual filing date? Well, again, you know, you know that, that could be here, yes? If you're claiming this priority, it's not going to count, right? So, well, I don't think the A is the best one there, right? Yes? Prior to having a date between an application's actual filing date and a claim priority date is never useful. So, is this time in here never useful? Hmm. I don't think about that one, right? Okay. An application's grace period is always measured from the application's actual filing date. Well, that one we know is false, right? So A and C are out, right? The best prior art date is any date more than a year before the earliest possible effective filing date. Yeah, that's probably the safest one. So here's your provisional. You go a year before. You're way out here. Man, yeah, that's got to be a good one to look for, right? Okay? I wouldn't say never in there, right? So, correct answer is what? D, yes? So A is false because a claim for priority can affect a filing date, right? Um, B is false because intervening prior art can be used when the applicant is not entitled to the priority date. Oh, so they may be claiming the priority date but not get it. Ah, hmm, so that's kind of a, yeah, that's kind of a tricky one there, right? And C is false because the grace period is always measured from the what? The effective filing date which you can get by claiming the priority for the earlier application. All right. Okay. So, let's look here at exceptions. Okay. And again, go back to USC 102. So, we're looking at paragraph B, number one. And under number one, A. So, exception B, one. Disclosures made one year or less before this. Yes? And then you go to A, the disclosure was made by the inventor or joint inventor 
or another who obtained the subject matter disclosed directly or indirectly from the inventor or the joint inventor. So all the stuff in B1A comes from where? The inventor. Yes? Okay. That's what we're going to look for first. And for this exception to hold, that disclosure has to be made, what? Within the grace period. If it's before the grace period, the exception's no good. Yes? Right? And it has to be from the what? From the inventor. Or somebody who got it from the inventor. Yes? And, um, yep, there you go. All right, so let's take some examples of that. Okay, so here's a little flow diagram. Okay, Al, Bob, and Cy. Okay, we could use Nick, Isaac, and Daniel. Same thing, right? Okay, so May 1 is the year before you file it, right? So your grace period goes from May 1 of 2015 back to May 1 of 2014. And you disclose it sometime in that grace period, well, then the exception is good. Because you're what? Within the grace period. Yes? No brainer. All good. Yes? All right. So the examiner cannot use this as prior art because it's your own disclosure within the grace period. All right. Everybody good with that? So we refer to that as a 102B1A exception. Okay, not only do you have to know that's an exception, you have to know it's a what? A 102B1A exception. Yes? All right, so let's try some more here, okay? All right, so again, um, you file this thing on May 1, 2015, okay? If in that grace period, Alan Bob disclosed some subject matter in a journal article, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. If Bob discloses it by himself or offers it for sale to the public, well, that's fine. He's still one of the inventors, yes? And it's still in the grace period. I don't say die. Who's die? Is die one of the inventors? No. Uh oh. Well, this is looking a little bit more interesting now. Die disclosed the subject matter at a trade show after obtaining it from who? Psi. Ooh, let's look at 102 B1A again. Disclosure was made by the inventor or joint inventor or by another who could be who? Die. Who obtained the subject matter from who? Psi. Yes. No. Oh, five minutes. Okay. All right, so that looks okay, right? So no problem there. All that's good. All right, now let's look at 102B1B. Okay? 102B1B. The subject matter disclosed had, and here's the, the very important thing, before such disclosure, okay, been publicly disclosed by the inventor or a joint inventor or another who obtained the subject matter disclosed directly or indirectly from the inventor or a joint inventor. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, let's see if we can figure this one out. So, 102B1B says, this is a third-party disclosure. Okay? So, this is not by the inventors. This is by somebody else. Right? And that third-party disclosure must have been made during the Invention grace period, an inventor originated disclosure must have been made prior to the third party's disclosure, and both must have been disclosed subject matter of X. Okay? So this means that the inventors have to disclose it before the other people disclose it. Yes? If the inventors disclose it before the other people disclose it, then you can get rid of the other people's. Alright. So compare these two, right? There's USC, or USC, yeah, USC 102B1A, exceptions, inventor. USC 102B1B, exceptions, okay, disclosures by third party, okay? Yes? This one is what? Within the grace period, yes? Does this one have to be within the grace period? Yes. Yes, the disclosure by the third party has to be within the grace period. Yes? Okay? But does it say anything about the disclosure by the inventors? No. Okay? We'll see you next time.
The disclosure was made by the inventor or joint inventor. Here, the disclosure was made by what? The third party. So let's look at some timelines and you'll see how this works out. Because we've got, speaking of timelines, we've got two minutes. Because I'm late. Okay. It was disclosed by the inventor more than one year before the patent application, then that would be fine? With respect to not using the third party's stuff. Yes? Okay. You're getting to the very point of this, right? Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go through this little exercise. I think you'll see what, what your question is. Okay. Right? Because this is the confusing point. Alright? So, this timeline, pretty straightforward. The inventors disclose, some third party discloses. Well, you know, these guys disclosed in their grace period, so not a problem. Right? Yes? These guys obviously took it from them. Yes? So, we can knock out both of these guys as prior art. Right, Garland? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. The, the, that verse. Yeah. Let's look at these inventors over here. Let's say the inventors disclosed before the grace period. Yes? These guys, Ty, took it from the inventor, but Ty disclosed it during the grace period. So the examiner cannot use what Ty disclosed. Yes? That's exempted. Because the inventor disclosed it first. Now Garland can say, well, who cares? The inventors disclosed it before the grace period. They already messed themselves up. And he'd be exactly right. Yes? Yeah. But as an examiner, you have to know which prior art you can use. Right? You can use this to knock him out, but you can't use that one because it was disclosed first by these guys. Yes? So I said, well, who cares if you get an exception? Right? You're still knocked out because these guys disclosed before the grace period. But you need to care because you need to know which paragraph describes the prior art that you can use to knock him out. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he's still knocked out. That's true. But you had to knock him out fairly. Yes? So he knocked him out based on his disclosure, not the disclosure of the third party. Yes? Now, what if this third party disclosure was before the grace period? Then you could use that as well. Yes? But a third party disclosure is in the grace period, you can't use it. You can use Bob's disclosure before the grace period. Yes? Right? If Bob did it afterwards, then you couldn't use it. Right? But this exception for B1B is for the third party. It's not for the inventors. Right? The inventors are knocked out already because of that disclosure. Right? So we'll talk more about this on Monday when we come back. You can see it starts getting complicated when you look for specific reasons why the prior art is valid as prior art or why it's not. Yes? Okay, so what I want you to do um, here in assignment number 11 is go through those restriction questions that I gave you the answers to, right? See if you understand why you get the answers you get. And then go through 102, USC 102. Read through it several times. All four of the paragraphs, A, B, C, and D. Yes? And then build a table or flow chart, something like the ones that the USPTO came up with, right? To help you figure out which paragraph applies to which kind of prior art. Yes? Mm -hmm. Because when we come back next time, we're going to see if we can have a little quiz over this stuff for paragraphs A and B. Yes? Right? And you can use your little flow charts or your tables to help you answer the questions on that quiz. Right? So make good ones for yourself. Are you with me? Because how well you make up that little flow chart or that little table is going to determine how well you can answer which prior art can be used as prior art to knock out this invention of yours. Okay, make sense? All right?
Yes? All right. What's it take to be special class? Hard, Hard work, work, sir. sir. Hard, Hard work. work. Okay. All right. Well, thank you then, and have a good day. All that stuff.